right, so the last time we talked about what we were doing is moving through these first uh, or lower layers of the OSI model and what needs to be done to data before it can be transported. And what we were going over is the addressing and the hardware, what hardware is concerned with that addressing, and PDU. PDU is our protocol data unit. And what we said that really meant was uh, what does data look like at each layer once you add the information from that layer to it in encapsulation. So we've already talked about the addressing at the physical layer, which was broadcasting or none. What does data look like uh, if these devices are only concerned with bits or the binary transmission. And the hardware that's concerned with this addressing in this PDU is the repeater and the hub. And data link layer, the addressing is the MAC address. And when we add a source and destination MAC address with the CRC and FCS, and the payload, which is our actual data, it's called the frame. Uh, NIC cards are concerned with that. They have the MAC address. Bridges are concerned with that. They keep tables of MAC addresses to make their choices to forward or discard frames. Switches use virtual circuits to create collision domains by keeping a table of MAC addresses so that it knows what physical port that information last traveled through so it can make that connection with only the receiver who needs to see that. The other ports will not have traffic on them. Uh, then we went to the network layer, which is concerned with IP addresses and the public and private classing system, or the IP addresses that are used inside of our local area networks and the IP addresses that are used on the outside in the wide area network. Uh, these are exchanged at the router, and we'll talk about that some more in another lecture. Uh, the device that is concerned with IP addresses that keeps a table of IP addresses and MAC addresses. Remember, all the devices will continue to function with the information up to its own layer. So routers keep tables of MAC addresses and IP addresses. Um, routers that separate the boundaries between your local area network and another local area network is called a gateway. Also, routers that separate local area networks from wide area network are also gateways. They're the gateway out of your local area network. All routers found outside of your local area network and between that and your destination network are known as hops or routers along the way to get to your destination. That brings us to the transport layer. Now, if we look at the flow of data, we started out out of the back of the NIC card as electrical pulses and the NIC card added information that allows us to share information between nodes. Node is any device on a network, generally, that has an IP address, but, or at least some kind of addressing. And these are between nodes within our network, and if you need to leave your network, you must pass a router. So if we go between two networks, you must pass a router. If you're leaving your network, you have most likely either made a request for a service or you're providing a service uh, with outside your network. Now, who provides services and who are requests for services made to? Now, we've said um, a couple of days ago when we described a peer-to-peer -peer network, which is what our next chapters are actually going to discuss, and a client-server architecture network or the enterprise architecture network, is determined by whether or not there's a server there, really. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, every node on the network can act as a client or a server, which means it can request or provide network services. And in an enterprise, the client requests services and the server provides those services. So we've probably made a request for a service, and if it's going outside of our network, then the transport layer is going to be involved. So if we wanted to know what kind of addressing there is at the transport layer, after this nice long presentation of discussion we just had about you've probably requested a service or whatever, addressing, what is the addressing at this layer? All right, so we know that there's an IP address, and I said everything kind of carries along with it. We keep our MAC addresses secret outside of our network because we don't want people getting into our actual computer. So the IP addressing scheme is still there. And if it's leaving your network, you're not using your private address anymore. Your public IP address has been substituted. And we will learn what that exactly means um, once we get to the, uh, the transport layer. 
Um, once we've discussed past that, ugh, I hate the phone interruption. Uh, once we get past the transport layer, we'll discuss network address translation or the exchanging of our public IP address for our private IP address. But right now, we're just going to say, okay, an IP address is involved. Because to get there, we had to know what the destination IP address was. We typed in something like facebook.com or yahoo.com or mypictures.com and we're going somewhere. <coughs> so we're going to see an IP address. And if it's outside in the world, it's going to be a public IP address. So I'm just going to make up a public IP address. Uh, 69.83.150.42. There we go. Now this is an IP address that's outside of our network. We know it's in the public side. So we know we're going out there. So that's the first half of that piece of address. Now, once we've left our network, and of course, any transmission that goes from one place to another was most likely either a request or providing a service. Now, how do we know what service? Well, it depends on, of course, what you've requested. So what we've done is we've assigned these services some numbers. And the number here after the colon is the number for that service. So let's say that we wanted to look at a web page. And this would be the address. There's a translation that occurs. I typed in facebook.com or yahoo.com. And a service called DNS is actually translated those texts into an IP address. And here is our imaginary IP address on the local side. So the computer translates it to this IP address, and then, of course, whatever service was requested, we set a web page. Web pages is HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And, of course, port 80 is one of the two ports for web pages. Of course, full duplex communication, meaning travels in both directions. We need one for sending and one for receiving. So if you look in the book, you'll see that HTTP... HTTP has the service number or what's called a port number of 80 or 110 depending on the directions the information is traveling. Other port numbers you should look at and memorize yourself. Be familiar with the most common ones HTTP, FTP, SMMP, SATMP. This is a simple transfer mail protocol, the simple network management protocol the file transfer protocol. These are the things of how do I get my email? How do I monitor my network? How do I get to a web page? How do I download a file? So you'll need to learn those and take a look at those in the book yourself. So your IP address with this port number, port number, port number. So an IP address with port number. So now I'm showing you what the diagram looks like. An IP address with a port number. This is called, now, and the book will tell you, first of all, let's talk about some port numbers here. And I'm going to have to sip over here for a second. Let's grab something that I just printed out of yesterday. when I'm done. It's an amended version of the sheet that I gave you earlier this week. Okay. Alright, so basically we have a set of port numbers. Now, this is a bit rate. I told you guys, what is a bit rate? When you take a bit, it has a value when it's on or off. And when you string those bits together, the number gets multiplied times two. So this is the largest number you can represent. Uh, examples of that start uh, at zero, and then of course if you turn it on it's one, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, and so on, until we get up to above 65,000 and some change. So what they've done is use these bit rates to allow the value to represent up to over 65,000. So zero, zero through 1024 are what we call well-known ports. These are 
the services we use most often, like the ones we just mentioned. Uh, web pages, HTTP, file transfer protocols, simple network management protocols, the simple, um, I'll let you catch up to writing, <laughs> um, and, and other protocols which you'll see in the book, so I don't have to keep listing them. Uh, then we have 1,025 until you reach up to 49,151. And these are called registered. Registered court, court numbers, registered courts. And then of course, forty nine one fifty two until. 6535, 6535, 6535, 6535, Back about 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when people played video games online and they wanted to involve voice chat between individuals, uh, they didn't have a service that was set up for voice chat or included within the software. You had to have an extra piece of software to get this video chat involved. So you could play the game, but you also needed a, third piece, uh, a piece of third party software like TeamSpeak or Ventrilo so that you could talk with people on the other end. Now they didn't have a port that was set up, so you just kind of had to choose one. Now that software chose one out of the dynamic set because they're like, well, nobody's really using this in-game voice chat. Uh, so they chose one in the upper end. Later, as this became a common uh, occurrence when people would play video games and have voice included, they started, oh, we'll just use one of these registered ports and we'll make this one the voice chat, which was 8767 for certain pieces of software. Uh, now you can set up your own voice chat software server and then choose your own port number and that was fine too, but a register one did, did take over after a while. <coughs> now in the book it says when you take this IP address and you put it together with a dynamic port that it has a name. Well I think that if you apply it to any connection where you have to make a connection with someone else on the other end and uh, this one-to-one -one connection between you and the server and group of, of computers or between you and another computer directly connected to share this information, it helps to call it that also, at least for understanding. So it, in, the, in the real world, it might say, well, you know, an IP address with a dynamic port is called a name. I'm going to say that any IP address with this port number is called this particular name. And the name that we're going to use for when you have an IP address with a port number to give you a service connection is called a socket. It just helps you better understand the kind of connection that's being made between the computer and computer or the computer and the server or the client and server. So what we're saying is that the addressing here, we, we could say it's actually two things. You could say, well, it's either the IP and the port number. But our generic term that we're going to use for what is it you have an IP and a port number is called a socket. And you can say that the port numbers are assigned to services. So that's kind of a round robin of explanation. IP address and a port number is known as a socket, and port numbers are registered or assigned to services. So when you have an IP address and a port number, you know the service that's being requested. <coughs> All right. So
so this was pretty simple. I kind of listed the hardware that we were discussing the whole time. So the hardware is actually pretty simple too. So I'm just going to write that in here. Hardware. And we can squeeze it up right in there too. All right, so generically, what is the hardware that functions at this layer? Now, I already said it's a transport layer. Um, you're either making a request for some services or you're providing a, a service. So what was the devices that request services and what was the devices that provided services? client and the server. The definition of a client was requests network services and the definition of a server was provides network services. So if the addressing here is a port number that's assigned to services, the hardware must be who's asking for the service, a client, who's providing the service. How is that going to be a hardware? The server. Here's a server right here. It is a computer with network operating system software. What is the difference between a computer that you use at home and a server? The hardware. I mean the software. No, you're right the first time. The hardware. The difference is in the hardware. What's the differences in the hardware between a server and a client computer that you have at home? It does. Well, it does more, which means, what's the difference in the hardware? Physically, what's the real difference? If it does more, it must need more what? Um, um. You can go through the entire list. If it does more, it, what kind of CPU must it have compared to the computer you have at home? A better one, right? Uh, what, how, mu how much hard drive storage space must it have? Lots. More, that's right. So you probably got more than one hard drive right. or an array of hard drives. Right. And what you learned in your hardware class is called a RAID yeah. or a SCSI chain, one of the two. Either a bunch more hardware, uh, hard drives connected to each other because you need more storage. And uh, versions of these hardware uh, storage devices either can help protect each other. So if you lose one, you can recover that data by decoding it from the other ones. Uh, and you'll learn more about it specifically in your PC class with Mr. Dexter. Um, also, if I have to manage more currently running processes, I might need a little more RAM in my computer, the current memory that's running. Uh, so, better hardware. I need better processor, more hard drive space, and more RAM. Now that's one, that's, I wouldn't say it's a huge difference. Because my computer over here is a client machine, but it has more RAM in it than any computer in this school. But it's not a server. It has a better processor than any computer in this school. As a matter of fact, the best processor in this school are the student computers that you build. They are dual core processors. Two cores, two processors in one, basically. All the other computers in the school, single core processors. You students build dual core processors. My computer that I have over here on the side of my desk, which belongs to me, that I built and brought in here to do things that I don't feel that the school provided me with this dual core processor machine here, but there are things that I need to do that are much more task oriented, multiple tasks being done at the same time. So I have a quad core hard processor over there. I got four cores in one, one machine. Um, so it's still not a server though, but my hardware is better. So a server should have better hardware, but doesn't have to, but it does help. Now, on the other thing, you already set out that there's another difference, and that is software. software. That's right. Your client machines have what are called operating systems. Here's an example. This is Windows XP Professional. Professional just means it supports networking. And what we mean is network groups. All of them support networking, or you couldn't get to the Internet. But it supports network groups, and that's Windows XP. Windows uh, Vista and Windows 7, these are also operating systems. Servers run network operating systems, or NOS, instead of just OS. So your network operating system examples are things like 
Windows Server 2003 or Windows Server 2008 or certain versions of Linux and Unix. Certain versions of Novell's Netware. These are network operating systems, meaning that in the software you have utilities built in to help monitor and maintain networks. In the future, we'll learn about the kind of operating system that runs on a router called an iOS. So we have OS, NOS, and iOS. We're almost done. And that is why the client and server are the two pieces of hardware that function at this layer. I know, like I said, it's sort of a generic term, but it is the kind of thing that runs here at the transport layer because requesting and providing services is what the transport layer is all about. Now, we do have one more piece that we can add here, and it's just like the client and server. You say, well, that's only really a kind of a, a minor hardware and software difference. It's a, a fine line between hardware and software when we talk about the client and the server. It's true for the third device that we say functions at the transport layer. This device is responsible for allowing or blocking traffic based on port numbers and or services. What device blocks services based on port numbers? What device monitors traffic or blocks traffic based on services? Whoop. A little burn down in the reading. The firewall. <laughs> oh, <sh> <laughs> I know how it is. It was in the morning. I don't like the morning you class can, either. You, one eye open and needs to No, when you say that, you know it like stones you off and stuff. I know it does. And what I did was I just set it backwards in the book. The book says a firewall is a device that blocks traffic based on services or port numbers. And I said, what is the device that blocks services and port numbers? It is the firewall. So firewall is a third answer that you can put for what is a hardware that functions at the transport layer. All right, now to get into a little specifics. We're, all we have left to know is what is the protocol data unit at this layer, or what does data look like? Now this one's a little more complicated because now as far as understanding, it's a little more complicated. But as far as the answer goes, there's two answers. The two answers are, well, what kind of service do I need? Do I need a reliable service? Or do I need a fast service? But you can't get one in between. I wouldn't need one in between. You want it reliable. Everything you Why you can't covered. combine them? Why you can't combine them? You want it reliable. But because one has error pay. checking and the other one doesn't. And if you have to be oh. error, do error checking to make sure that everything that you sent is received, it won't be fast, okay, but it will be reliable. Now let's back that up and uh, address your statement in the real world. See, over here is theory, and over <laughs> here is the real world. In the real world, how fast does network data travel down that cable? At the speed of what? Light. Okay, is that fast? Yeah. Okay, so even if it's reliable, is that still fast? Yeah. Yeah. So what we're talking about is the difference of milliseconds. <laughs> so. Will I get my data in one second, or will I get my data instantly? So, it's still fast, no matter how we look at it. But the point being is that it's faster versus more reliable. So, when it needs to be more reliable, it means that I need to make a one-to-one -one connection with you. I need to get my data assembled, meaning you can't put the last piece at the beginning, or whatever it is I'm needing to see is not going to make sense. So if I'm trying to download a movie, all that, download a movie, not stream a movie. So I might need to download a movie. Do I want to see the end of the movie before the beginning? Yeah. No. Do I want to hear the middle of the song before I hear the beginning? No. And do I want to see the bottom of the picture before I see the top? Do I want the picture to be all rearranged and jumbled up? No. So reliability is still going to be fast. It's going to be speed of light fast. But it needs to be reliable in that make sure I get all the pieces before you put the puzzle together. Make sure all the pieces of the puzzle are put together in the right order. So there's a service that we're talking about. Not really is it fast or slow. Mm -hmm. It's just 
fast, as in this, every time I re receive something, uh, receives, receives chunks with acknowledgments. Who else chair? There we go. Receives chunks with acknowledgments. When it's fast, it uses what we call best effort delivery. Now, I'm kind of setting you up here for something you've seen before. Instead of telling you what we're talking about, I'm kind of going through and listing the attributes of the style of connection that we're trying to make. So when things are reliable and they receive chunks with acknowledgments, we're probably using what protocol? Can you remember the two main protocols that we use at the transport layer from another class? I don't expect that. I know you had. We're on tape. <laughs> well, here's a clue to the other side. TCP? TCP is reliable, receives chunks of information with acknowledgments, meaning, oh, that data is good, yeah. But which one was fast and uses the best effort delivery to deliver its information? Yep. UDP. Don't be afraid because we're on camera. That was the right answer. UDP. So it's TCP and UDP. One is for when it needs to be fast, best effort delivery. That's like when I'm watching the game on television, it's live stream. So when I go to the internet and say, let me watch the game on the internet, it's live stream. Can you, until the invention of the DVR, could you rewind live streams? No. He shook his head. No. You couldn't, re you couldn't rewind the live streams. If you were taping it, you had to stop the tape and then rewind the tape. And then you was missing the game that was coming. You weren't being able to tape that. So it's fast, best ever delivery. So if I'm in the middle of watching a live game, you watched it on television, and you should watch it on cable, and you know there's like a storm going on, so you don't have the best reception. And the man goes to punt the ball, and right before he kicks it, it goes blurry and squiggly. And then all of a sudden it comes back, and they show the ball floating through the air. Are you going to be able to go back and watch him kick it? Are you going to want to go back and see him kick it? Or you just want to stay on top of what's happening now, what's happening now? So if you want to stay on top of what's happening now, you need to be fast and use best effort delivery. It's going to be a UDP connection. If you need to watch a movie and you're trying to download this movie, whether you buffer it or download it or look at a picture or you're listening to the radio and it's being saved or buffered, that's kind of a hint and a clue to let you know most of the time that it's probably receiving chunks of information with acknowledgments to make sure that these things are going to be in order and correct. So, what was all this blobbing about? Well, with UDP, whenever you're using the best ever delivery, it just means it's taking these packets and throwing them at you one at a time. And when you take those packets and you add this delivery of service information to it, UDP sends out one datagram at a time. One datagram at a time. So the PDU for UDP is datagram. Now the analogy for TCP is pretty simple. Datagram. You have a letter to send. You drop it in a mailbox. It gets delivered and there it is. If you use USPS, the United States Postal Service, and you drop a letter in the mailbox, is it going to get there? You hope so. But do you get a confirmation that it got there? No. Whoever received it might say, ring, 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 thanks for the letter. But you don't really know. You don't get no, you know, I have a package for you to sign <laughs> for. <laughs> That's not going to happen. It uses best effort delivery. You stick it in the box, and you hope that they make their best effort to pick up those letters, sort them at the mail place, drive them up and down the street with trucks and airplanes from here to there, and then sort them out again and then deliver them to the address that you had on it. 
They make their best effort to deliver your information. Sometimes they lose it. <coughs> now, TCP is more like, let's say, UPS. What they do is they say, hey, we have a truckload of datagrams. Beep, beep. A truckload of datagrams that need to be delivered. So they load up the truck full of datagrams. And the two ends agree on, hey, um, how many packages can you fit in this truck? And we agree. That's that flow control that we talked about that happens at the transport layer. And then we also agree on two things. One, how many packages can we fit in the truck? And how big can each package be? Once we agree on those two things, we've agreed on the maximum transmission unit and the flow control this is called a sliding window, although we're using a truck for our example. So a sliding window is a group of datagrams that are sent from one place to another, and they receive one acknowledgment. This group of datagrams that receives one acknowledgment is called a segment. That's right. So the protocol data unit at the TCP part of the transport layer is a segment, or a whole bunch of datagrams that receives one acknowledgement. These whole bunch of datagrams are put into a sliding window, they go to the other side, they get all checked, and if they're correct, one acknowledgement is sent back and says, yes, that's good. UDP is fast, best effort delivery. It sends one datagram at a time. If it drops datagrams and doesn't receive them, it doesn't matter. It just continues to process datagrams that were successful. So, at the transport layer, the addressing is an IP address with a port number. A port number is a number that is assigned to a service. Your IP address with the port number is known as a socket. So I will accept the addressing as IP address and a port number or a socket. The appropriate answer should be socket. The hardware that functions with port numbers and or con connects sockets to either provide or request network services is the client server which is the client and the server that provides it, or a firewall, which blocks information by port number and or service. And what does data look like at the transport layer? When it needs to be fast, one at a time, best ever delivery, it's called a datagram. When it's sent in large chunks or sliding windows full of datagrams that receive one acknowledgement, they're called a segment of datagrams. So this is the last piece, and then so we'll be done for today. So it's going to change the name again. Yes, each layer has a different name. That was the whole PDU of each layer, <laughs> having a different name. Here the PDU is bits. Here it's called the frame. Here it's called a packet. A packet with, that has the information added from services and the port number is called a datagram. And if you have a whole bucket load or a whole sliding window full of datagrams, they all get checked out, and when they're correct, we say our segment full of datagrams is correct. So, um, I forgot what that last piece was. Well, that's really all the information as far as the quiz and the test goes and understanding those first four layers. I'm sure I'll remember what that other piece is and we'll talk about.